I guess I'm gonna be the last speaker today, so thanks uh, everyone for staying this late. Uh, I promise to be brief. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in this uh, very interesting uh, round table. Oh my God, yeah, sorry, Omar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're all G Barcelona GC here, so I thought this would be more useful. <laughs> so, okay, so um, first of all, let me say that uh, a lot of what I'm going to say today is going to be based on research that I did with uh, two other Barcelona GSC members, Lidia Farre from the Institute, who's uh, back there, I can see, and also Francesc Ortega, who who's still, well, he's on, who's currently on leave from Pompeo Fabra. So it's a joint work. Okay, so I have worked a little bit on the impact of immigration on the Spanish economy, so I'd like to share um, with you some conclusions based on this research. Um, okay, so I, I won't repeat the numbers that um, Nuria already gave you, but let me just start by highlighting again the, just the magnitude of the recent uh, migration inflows in Spain. So here I focus on the working age population, and if you look at this 10-year period from 1998 to 2008, we're talking about uh, the foreign-born fraction of the, foreign of the working age population increasing from 2 to 16 percent, and this is according to local registry data, so Padrón Municipal. So we're talking about a, a lot of people uh, and a very fast um, inflow. Uh, it is also true, and I'll come back to this at the end, that there has been a significant slowdown since 2008. So we're talking about a very concentrated uh, episode in time. Uh, something that we, so this is the reason why we thought it would be interesting to study the Spanish case in the context of trying to understand the economic effect of immigration on the destination country, which is one of the big questions that uh, Gina raised at the beginning, and I think the um, economics literature has focused uh, a lot on this, this issue of the effect of immigration on the destination country, but there's also uh, many other interesting questions that Gino mentioned, but this is what we look at. But one thing that we have exploited in this research is not only the magnitude of the inflows in this short time period, uh, but also the fact that this, these inflows have not been um, uniformly distributed across Spanish ge geography. To the contrary, there's been large variation in the magnitude of immigrant inflows across Spanish regions. So this gives rise to a nice uh, case study where, you know, if average inflows were this large, I can tell you that some regions essentially received no immigrants. So some other regions, the inflows were, were even larger. So that's uh, what we try to uh, exploit in this research, uh, mostly the regional variation. I'll skip the graph that Nuria already showed you. Let me just, uh, for international comparison, if you think about the early to mid 90s, Spain was at the bottom of, um, of uh, Europe in terms of the fraction of the population who was uh, born abroad. Nowadays, this is data from Eurostat for 2009. Uh, Spain, in terms of uh, foreign born population as fraction of total population is way ahead of uh, most if not all other European countries including Germany, France, uh, the UK, with uh, almost 14% uh, foreign born population, this is 2009, um, compared with less than 12% in Germany um, and about 11% in the UK. So again, it's a very extreme uh, case and that's why it makes for an interesting case study. Um, okay, so let me start by talking a little bit about labor market effects, which is uh, of course my, my topic. Um, so how do we try to um, evaluate the impact of these uh, large migration flows on the, um, on the Spanish labor market? What we do is we take a regional approach. So we don't try to evaluate the national level effect, but we try to compare. So basically the idea would be look at the evolution of uh, different labor market variables uh, in regions that received a lot of immigration compared with uh, the evolution of these same variables in regions that didn't receive immigration during the time th during the same period so you know we have a treated and a control group of course we have to be very concerned about uh, migration uh, so the destination choices of migrants are not um, so destination is not random immigrants go to certain regions for specific reasons so in this research the, the most important challenge is to try to find exogenous sources of variation for migrant uh, destination choices so we use a uh, an instrumental variables approach where we try to isolate the um, 
immigrants that go to certain regions, not because the labor market was particularly good, but for other reasons. For example, there were uh, historical uh, settlements from their source country already established in certain provinces. So we try to exploit um, reasons for moving to a certain region that are not uh, purely labor market uh, related. Okay, so not to get into detail, but so let me just give you three uh, main results. The first thing that we find is that immigration did have a large impact on total employment in the sense that, well, you know, many uh, workers came and they found jobs and the total, the size of the workforce, uh, of the workforce increased significantly as a result of the arrival of immigrants. So um, this did have a large impact in the labor market. Um, but the second interesting finding, um, as you, as I think Gina mentioned, a lot of the literature on the impact of immigration on uh, destination countries is about wage effects on natives. Um, just like the studies in uh, other countries with similar methodologies, we do not find that the huge migration flows had uh, a negative impact on the wages of native workers or the unemployment rates of uh, native workers. So that's, um, I mean, yeah, we, we looked everywhere and that's nowhere to be found. Uh, this won't be surprising. I'm just going to show you some aggregate data, which this is not the variation that we exploit in the paper, but just seeing the aggregate numbers, it's not so hard to believe that there was no huge impact of immigration. This is the unemployment rate in Spain between 1996 and 2011. And these two lines mark between 2000 and 2008, this is the period where, where the bulk of the migration inflows happened. As you can see, this is the period in the Spanish economy where unemployment rates were falling and the lowest that they've been in um, recent history. So, you know, perhaps they would have been even lower uh, without immigration. We don't know that, but our research suggests that's, uh, that's, uh, that's not the case. So we don't find that unemployment rates decreased less in regions that received uh, a lot of immigrants. And the same thing can be said can be said for wages. This is um, average annual wages, yearly earnings actually, in real um, euros. The pink line is average wage in all sectors, and then I also show it uh, by sector. This is uh, manufacturing, um, services, and construction. And I mean, you do see that the real wages didn't really increase much or at all during the period of the large migration inflows. But keep in mind that these figures for wages in include the wages of the immigrants themselves who earn on average much lower wages than the natives. So our research again suggests that the regions, um, in the regions that received a lot of immigrants, natives that worked in similar jobs compared with immigrants did not suffer uh, more pronounced uh, um, wage decreases or their wages didn't increase slower than in regions that received fewer immigrants. So we don't find evidence of detrimental effects on the labor market outcomes of, um, of natives. What we do find, though, is uh, some complementarity type effects. So we find some effect of immigration on the labor supply of skilled native women. This is a positive effect, meaning that immigration seems to have worked to increase the labor supply of a specific subset of the um, labor force in Spain, college educated uh, native women. In particular, uh, skilled women with what we call family responsibilities. So either women with very small children or with uh, elderly dependents. So uh, these are women who uh, t could take advantage of uh, cheaper household services because we do show that in a, uh, following immigration, uh, the price of household services declined, mostly through immigrants taking, accepting um, lower wages. So skilled native women are able to apparently um, go back to work earlier after giving birth and also retire later when taking care of uh, elderly relatives. So that's certainly um, an effect that even though it affects a small fraction of the population, it's, it's still going to be uh, there in the, in the future. Okay, now moving uh, briefly away from direct uh, labor market effects, uh, we also look at, okay, so all these people came, they found jobs, they didn't affect uh, wages or unemployment rates for natives, so something had to give, so what, what, how did regions adjust to these inflows? 
We don't find large effects on regional specialization. So you might think that regions that received a lot of immigrants could have uh, specialized more in those sectors or industries that tended to use immigrant type of labor more intensively. We don't find a lot of, uh, of that. What we do find is changes in skill intensity at industry level. What is that? What do I mean by that? And here I'm going to have to disagree slightly uh, with uh, Nuria. So if we look at the age group where most immigrants uh, belong, uh, natives in Spain have been increasing their education level very fast in recent cohorts. So that you see in Spain a large move in the labor market towards an increase in the um, educational level of the workforce. And in regions that received a lot of immigrants, uh, the average um, education level of uh, the workforce did decline for people in their 20s and, and 30s. So we do see that regions that received a lot of immigrants tended to use uh, a higher share of uh, lower educated workers in the same industry. So for example, in uh, construction, in uh, hotels and restaurants, in uh, household services, the regions that received a lot of immigrants just tended to move to or to upgrade uh, the educational attainment of the workforce more slowly because of uh, immigration. So that's what seemed to adjust um, at the regional level. And finally, let me say uh, a few words about a different market, not the labor market, but now the housing market. And um, well, you know, we had, we're talking about more than five million people moving to Spain in 10 years. Uh, I mean, it's amazing that we haven't talked more about their effects on the housing market because this coincides in time with a hum humongous uh, housing market boom. And here there's, uh, of course, two different uh, effects, related but different. On the one hand, these five million people have to live somewhere, so this large migration inflow must have increased the demand for housing, both uh, rental and uh, ownership. So, you know, an increase for the demand of housing should have led to higher prices and or an increase in construction activity. This is from the demand side. On the supply side, however, immigration also increased the labor supply, the availability of uh, labor in the construction sector. So this could have led to actually lower prices, but still should have uh, encouraged uh, more construction activity. So in one paper with uh, Francesc, we, we try to look at this, what was the overall effect? And what we find is that probably the demand effect dominated, implying that immigration did contribute significantly to the, to the Spanish uh, housing market boom. And again, this won't be very surprising for you when I show you the graphs for the housing, the aggregate housing market variables. I mean, the, again, this is not the variation that we're exploiting, exploiting but it's consistent. So this is, the, this is constru construction activity. So this is the number of new housing units built per year in Spain. Uh, in 2006, about 750,000 new housing units were built, and the peak here coincides almost exactly with the uh, with the uh, immigration boom. And immigrants were both, you know, uh, demanding, uh, looking for a place to live, and working in construction. So this is not very surprising. And this is the um, the housing prices uh, boom. This is the price of a square meter of housing in Spain between 1995 and 2011. Again, here you have. The two vertical lines are for the period of the immigration boom, and again, the, the timing is, uh, is coincidental. The uh, increase in house prices happened um, mostly between 2002, 2003, and 2008. Okay, so that was essentially all that I had to say. Let me just uh, finish with a couple of words about migration and the recession. As I showed you in the beginning, the foreign-born population um, stabilized in Spain since 2007. Um, and it, it's worth mentioning that out-migration flows have accelerated. So very recently, the National Statistical Institute reported that for the first time in many years, there's more people, more people moving out of Spain than moving into Spain. And those outflows uh, include both uh, recent immigrants going back to their source countries and native uh, Spaniards moving, out, moving abroad, uh, presumably as a result of the crisis. Okay, so uh, just to conclude uh, these few uh, thoughts, let me just say that in light of all the figures that we've seen from Nuria and myself, uh, I would conclude that migration flows in Spain seem to have uh, responded to economic conditions uh, much more than uh, be the main drivers of um, economic trends. <laughs>